So we're going to do a quick overview. Before we start, I did want to go ahead and share. Um, I know that Jennifer and Catherine already have the, in, um, well, I'm going to send them the invite, but um, I wanted to go ahead and disclose that we, this is not the full CES um, training. So that one, we are going to have it on October t uh, 10th. And Jennifer or Catherine will be sending you that invite for that training. So we're just going to go a brief review. Um, so if you have more questions, definitely I encourage you to join that training. It's going to be full CS. It's going to be from 930 to 12. We are going to go into the history, um, a little bit more about um, all the avenues that um, you can access CS, not just family. We are going to go more in depth into the family system. And then, of course, we're going to go through HMIS and the VSP dad. So um, I do encourage you to be able to attend if you, if you have any further questions after this um, presentation. So really quick, um, like I said, in this one, we're going to go ahead and share a little bit about the coordinator entry system, how to access CES. And then we'll focus on the family coordinator entry system, which Jeanette will go ahead and present um, an overview how to refer, what does the referral form look like, um, and what kind of um, programs do we find in the um, family system. So coordinator entry system. So the first thing that we wanna make sure that you understand is the definition of homelessness. So as you can see, um, in order to refer to CES, you do you do have to qualify within one of these categories based on HUD. So, I do want to disclose that this is not the same definition as you will find, for example, um, in an education system, but this is the one that is connected to housing. So either somebody is literally homeless or they're fleeing from domestic violence or at risk of homelessness. So if somebody is literally homeless, um, they actually will have to be staying in a shelter, in their vehicle or outside or any area which is not um, safe for them to be housed. So anything that wouldn't have like for example, water, things like that, or a tent, that would be considered literally homeless or a risk of homelessness. And of course that would be, um, they could be covered through prevention. And then of course, fleeing domestic violence. So like I share, like I said, we're going to go ahead and share this slide, but we will go more in depth in, in that, um, October 10th, um, training. So to get you an idea of what is CS, this picture is definitely, definitely helped to understand more than words do. Before um, CES was created, basically everybody, there was, it was like a puzzle. You will figure out where, how do I access CES? There's so many routes to be able to obtain housing. There was not one definite clear pathway or streamlined pathways. Um, so CES lays the groundwork to make it more efficient and effective. So that way you clearly understand if you're adult system, you go this way. If you're taste system, if you're youth, you follow this pattern. And if you're the family system, you follow this avenue. But if you see in the middle, it's all streamlined so that everybody can access um, housing. And it's more defined. It's more clear. We do work together. But um, the avenues for the three paths, depending where you fall at, are very clear as opposed to without CES, where you had to guess how do I refer? Where do I refer? There's no clear answer. So that's what CES created for our system. Now, our goal um, for the process flow, flow is access, assessment, prioritization, and matching. So access. It's meaning, like I said, like the picture showed, there's no wrong door approach in which a household can access the system. But everybody will know exactly how to refer and where to refer. And the family system, as you know, it will be the FSC or the Family Solution Center. That is where you refer families for the family system. So there is a clear access how to obtain services. Then is assessment using various tools to engage households progressively and appropriately. And this is where we come and, and you hear things like problem solving conversations or the screen tool or the assessment, this is, um, and I'll be, there'll be a picture um, in the next slide, so you could definitely, we'll go more into that. But this is where then after they access our system, then then our staff can provide that assessment to know exactly how to, to help either the adult system or in the family system or in the youth system. Then is prioritization. And this is where CES helps to prioritize individuals who are more vulnerable, who actually there's a difference between those that are literally homeless and those that are at risk of homelessness and also those that are actually fleeing domestic violence. And so there, we have clear definitions of how do we refer based on where you fall and what kind of services do we connect you to, match you to, 
based on where you fall and if you're more vulnerable, how to connect you to those services. For example, in the adult system, there is, for example, um, when you're an elder adult, there's even other components that they can attach you to uh, because you are um, older adult or in youth system, for example, if you come from foster, and you have no family or friend connection, there's even other resources that can connect you to. And that's what the process flow flow um, focuses on. And then it's a matching, it's connected to prioritization and matching to see what resources we can match you with or even housing we can match you with. And I will reiterate, uh, me and Jeanette through this presentation that as you know, because we are limited in what kind of actual housing we can match, whether it's individuals or families to, um, we really rely on the assessment part and the prioritization and connection to resources part because for families, it is a little bit more difficult to obtain housing and what is available. So this is what our goal is. And this is why you see that sometimes some families may be in that middle ground for a while. Um, and it's because of that, trying to connect them definitely to something um, that is available. And this definitely is the picture that I love the most because it really focuses on everything that kind of CES is. What is our goal? What is the system flow? If you follow the red line, you will see the problem solving is not only provided at the entrance of the access when um, a family gets connected, whether it is through 211 or whether it is through a family solution center um, to our system, we do problem solving conversations lightly. But of course, there's more in-depth conversation, especially when it's um, a family at risk um, and we could connect them back to uh, families that there are in the area or maybe friends that we're willing to take them for an interim time or maybe connect them to another state where they could be um, connected to maybe employment, for example. So this is why we heavily rely on problem solving. And you will see the areas where we try to kind of catch them, and that's why we have visualized safety net, either connecting them to employment services. Maybe they just need that aspect to increase their income, or maybe they just lost employment. Maybe it is legal advocacy because they're about to be, um, they've been told um, that they could be evicted. So, you know, we're catching them ahead of the, you know, so, uh, the process. Or maybe it is problem solving and connecting to family services. So depending where they fall, we really try to, depend a lot on catching them and preventing them for even entering CS because like I mentioned, it is very limited. Once they do access um, CS, like I mentioned, whether it is 211, whether it's actually walking in to an agency, whether it's through outreach, because outreach is catching families that are out there, then we continue problem solving. And of course, the assessment, which I mentioned, we rely heavily on um, at all times. But as you see, this can be done throughout, even once they enter our system, because we're limited and we they could be at a shelter a moment and for some reason they need to move or for some reason that shelter, um, it, voucher, for example, has a limitation and it has a end date. So then we need to always continue having these two and relying on these two. But after uh, problem solving, they will fall into interim housing, which is like I mentioned, shelter or uh, bridge housing, crisis housing, safe parking, for example, is considered part of our interim housing. And from there on, if there is something we can connect them to, connect them to, it will fall into permanent housing, which are kind of these options that they will fall into. And Jeanette will go a little bit more um, in depth a little bit about uh, what, how it looks at for just the family system. So I did mention that we all kind of interlap in that first image that I saw for CES. How does it look when it's streamlined? Because there is, of course, the family population, the single adults, and the youth uh, population. But how do they interlap? Well, for example, if there's a young couple and they could be under 24, um, maybe they're 21 or 18, um, and they were considered already part of the taste system, but then they, you know, the fall pregnant, um, then they can go ahead and stay in the youth system, you know, in the beginning of their pregnancy, but eventually we will have to do a warm handoff and connect them to it into the family system. So that's why we're interlapping, we work closely together. Or for example, if there's a family that you know of and suddenly they lose custody of their children, automatically when they lose custody of their children, um, we have to do a warm handoff. We don't just throw them back, but automatically they will be part of the single adults 
system because as you know the definition of um which we explain what does it mean to be a family so when that happens we work hand in hand warm hand off knowing that maybe the goal of the family is to obtain custody again and they could be bouncing back you know so we do work together with all the populations because of how we might interlap depending on what situation of the family we're referring is so how to access the CES system. As you know, you're very aware we have eight spas and we do have, just like um, the federal system has access centers in all the spas, we also have a lead agency, which is FSC, the Family Solutions Center in each of these spas. Um, and this is basically how it looks either for the youth or for the adult system or for the family system. So as you can see, there's some areas like spa one or spa eight where there is just one agency that covers all three populations and it's a little bit easier to navigate and for you to remember. But there are other areas like for example, spa four who's very condensed that will have three um, agencies. So for example, adults will be the people concerned, for families, it will be PATH, and then for youth, it will be the LA LGBT Center. So this, um, of course, I'm going to send you the PowerPoint, but this will definitely help you to figure out um, which agency for the family system you will need to connect to, depending what population and what spa the family is at. Um, and these are kind of the programs that we do uh, provide through CES. Um, like I said, homeless prevention, which you already kind of saw, problem solving, which I give you a little bit of ideas of what they are, access centers, whether it is depending what population um, you are, the street outreach, safe parking, legal services, employment services, um, travel subsidies. So it's quite robust. We provide a lot of services um, depending what is a need of the individual or the family. And how do we definitely connect into CS? As you're already aware, the agencies are there, but how can you connect? So for adult system, um, there is through the shelter or went to shelter, there is the actual access and navigation centers. They can be connected to safe parking through a DMH clinic. Also, is very popular. Mostly adults or individuals are connected through LA Hop. And that's when either loss of outreach teams or the agencies, outreach team will go out there and then make the connection and provide, you know, whatever resources they can and connect them to an agency. Um, for families, ideally, we recommend them to call 211. They can do that themselves and be connected um, to a shelter or support services or to an FSC. Um, and as you are aware, sometimes if it's available, they might be able to provide, uh, if it's an emergency, a motel voucher, depending on what is available at the time um, and if it's open and if it's an um, you know urgency that they will be able to provide for one or maybe even two nights. So it depends on capacity, what 211 can provide, but they could connect the family to an FSC and you all are able to connect them to an FSC, which Annette will go over that. And of course, the youth system, it will tell you how to connect them to um, CES. So I know I went kind of rush and very brief on, you know, what is CES and how to connect them, but are there any questions that you might have specifically for CES? Great, and like I mentioned, we're gonna go way in depth in history and the October 10th um, training. So I look forward to seeing some of you if you're interested to get more information, but to learn more about the family system, I'm gonna bounce it over to my counterpart, Jeanette. I just have a quick question. Yes. What is couch surfing considered? Good. So that's and that's why I kind of try to make the definition of like homelessness at the beginning, because yeah, for the education system, um, couch serving is when you're staying, you're, they call it like doubled up, um, or there's more than one individual in the household, whether you're staying in the living room or you're staying at, a, you know, one of the closets, there's some situations that are like that. For the education system, you would qualify, you will be, the, the children will be considered, the family will be considered homeless. Um, for our system, um, there are certain things that they will qualify for, but they will not be considered literally homeless because um, the way the HUD defines it is they would have to be staying at a location that is not considered housing. So if they're in somebody's apartment, automatically they are considered housed. Now, they could, um, because they could be at risk for homelessness, meaning the family could be saying, hey, you're staying on my couch, but I need you out by Friday. 
um, you can definitely do the referral and put there that they are at risk of homelessness because they have until Friday to leave that household. Or maybe they're with their cousins and their cousins stay until the end of the month. Um, and then problem solving can definitely, and you know, we'll go in a little more to that. But that's the difference between our definition and what is couch surfing. Thank you. You're welcome. So I'm going to pass it over to Jeanette. All right. Thank you, Yanni. So we'll go a little bit into the family coordinated system, which is more uh, tailored towards families. So we did want to just go over what this coordinated entry system refers to as a family. So it's any household that consists of one or more minor children in physical custody under a guardianship of a parent, right? So in theory, if Jane has a son who's three, but grandma is taking care of him and the son does not reside with her or grandma has custody of the child, then Jane is considered an adult, individual adult. So there needs to be physical um, custody present of a minor in order for them to be considered a family. This also then includes a pregnant parent. So if a parent is pregnant, um, then they are considered a family. And then there are qualified dependents, right? So sometimes families consist of somebody over the age of 18 who, for legal reasons, needs to continue being a dependent. They would then be considered a family within the uh, coordinated entry system. And if ever any of you are unsure, you're like, oh, you know, this is kind of maybe a family, maybe not. As Yenny stated, 211 is a great resource and they would be able to best to guide you based on that family's situation. And I do just want to state on this slide that we um, do understand that families sometimes consist of a grandma and an aunt and a sister who is an adult. Uh, they can all come into the system together as a family, but we just wanna be very transparent that the larger a family is in size, the harder it is sometimes to find shelter that will accommodate families of six, seven, 10, right? So um, there have been instances where if it's, two sisters and their kids, there have they certain FSCs will have conversations with these families of like, hey, maybe we should split up because uh, finding shelter for families who are in smaller pods might be uh, more available. Next slide. All right, and so um, as we stated, uh, LA County did get, it's so huge, right? So in order to combat homelessness, we do have, eight service planning areas or spas. And at every spa, we have a lead family solution center um, where we will be attaching these slides to, we will be sending these slides to Jennifer, whom I'm sure will get them out to you. And then you will have everyone's uh, name for the leading spas. So a little bit about what family solution centers are, right? FSCs. So they are our main access point for families that are experiencing homelessness. <clears throat> excuse me, they offer a range of services and resources uh, specifically targeted to help out families in this situation. And families can either choose to walk directly into an FSC. Some of the FSCs have phone numbers where they can be called and placed on a call log. You can send an email to initiate um, an assessment from these FSCs. Um, and now we're gonna talk about how we can connect them to FSCs. Oh, and we also wanted to highlight that FSCs also have co-located support, right? So at every FSC, we have somebody from these respective departments there. Now, they're not all there at the same time, right? Depending on every FSC, they could have different timeframes about uh, for when these people sit at the FSC. But just know that when you are connecting these families to an FSC, you are also collecting the, connecting them to the slew of other services that they provide. So this is the referral for an FSC. It is the sheet that is on your right-hand side uh, with the highlighted areas where you can fill in blanks. We will also be providing this referral form over to Jennifer who will then send it out to everybody. I know it's a little hard to see, but you can see that up on top, it has our eight lead FSCs. It not only gives you their name and the spa that they work for, but it also provides you with their email address, which is once you fill out this sheet, you would send over to that email address that's literally on top. Um, again, we want to just reiterate that you can call 211 if you don't know exactly what spa to refer to, and they will best ha uh, 
guide you on how and to where to submit. But the sheet is pretty, I know it's hard to read, but it is pretty simple. We ask just for a name, a contact number, the ages of the children in the family, about how much total income. Then the second part here that says referral information, this middle part, you would select the reason for why they're being referred and then the reason as to why you're referring to this FSC. So I know somebody asked a question about what if they're couch surfing? So there is a bubble on here that says that the family must vacate their current housing situation and they need to move out on blank date. That's where you could highlight, you know, if a participant is currently utilizing DPSS vouchers and they're going to be done at the end of the month, you would put in that they'll be done, you know, on 9 30 2023 if they're with a friend who's like hey you just you got to go you've been here for three months they would put the date when where that friend is telling them that they need to leave and so then this would highlight for the people on the other end receiving this referral that like oh hey th this is like we have some wiggle room we have some time frame to get to call this participant or it might be like hey no this is urgent this is now then on the bottom you would just put in your information and then there is an additional information little lines where you can add more information on there he'll feel free to put you know other identifying information or information that you would want to highlight to the fsc and so then we do want to have we do want to note some things right um so please we just want you all to be aware that family interim housing at any spa might not really be able to provide service in that moment, right? Because we are currently at capacity in a lot of spas. Um, so this does kind of hinder the amount of services that can be provided in at any given time, depending on what that day looks like, right? Um, so just be aware that the entire system is noticing a heavy impact. And so everywhere we're trying to, you know, move, shift things around to better provide service. Um, and just to be transparent, you know, every day, all these FSCs are working towards permanent housing with these families. So in theory, tomorrow, we could have two rooms come up online, the following week, there might be five, but then tomorrow, there might also be more families who need the system. And then the, um, that FSC might have to shut down due to capacity. We, uh, we also want to emphasize that the refer would be you. And just, you know, know that there is a wait time due to capacity. And so then I do want to highlight that the referral form does state that within three business days, an FSC should be getting in contact either with the person be making the referral if the participant does not have a phone or the participant. Um, but again, due to capacity and to the impact that these FSCs are seeing, it, this is taking closer to a two week turnaround time. And I do want to highlight one more thing that because let's say that, you know, in this case, Jennifer were to be the one that refers Jane over to Valley Oasis, let's say that they're in spa one, um, Valley Oasis will not turn around and let Jennifer know like, hey, Jennifer, we talked to Jane. This is kind of what happened uh, due to confidentiality reasons. So we do get sometimes on Jenny and I and we'll be like, hey, we said this referral three weeks ago and we haven't heard back. And, you know, the FSC might have gotten in contact with that participant already done an assessment and kind of gone over a game plan with that participant. That doesn't mean that that FSC will turn around and provide you an update again due to confidentiality. So we do want to talk about some of the resources that do live within the family CS. <clears throat> so the first one being problem solving. So problem solving is the component that is utilized most heavily throughout the F uh, the coordinated entry system, the CES, just because it is a short-term intervention that can be plugged in at any moment within the journey of a family going through homelessness. And problem solving is more are more flexible dollars that can provide different um, avenues for these families, right? Such as permanent housing, they can provide that security deposit, let's say that a, a family might need and that's it, right? Not, no ongoing rent, they just need that initial move-in deposit, which might provide security deposit and first month's rent. Um, they also have some maintaining their own residence. So if there are families who have six months or less of rental arrears, problem solving is the program that would then kick in and help them play with that. Family reunification. If my participant Jane is currently homeless here in LA County, but has an aunt in Nashville who's like, come, I will take you and your son. Like, 
just come over here. That problem solving can help with reunifying that family, whether that be buying plane tickets, buying train tickets, buying some sort of providing gas cards in order to reunify that family. Temporary living or moving in with family and friends. This is also this is to highlight. Um, somebody said, like, what if I have a family staying on a couch, right? we can incentivize that friend because sometimes it is hard, right? Like if I had a friend who was going through homelessness, I'd be like, sure, here's my couch. You can sleep here. But after six months of being on my couch and not being able to provide anything for me, there's going to be some friction being caused there. So what problem solving does is it steps in and it says, Hey, Jeanette, thanks for being Jane's friend. We would like to incentivize you with this much money because you are hosting her for this much allotted of time. And so then that changes the relationship, right? And if it's like, oh, okay, you can incentivize me, Jane can continue to stay here as long as, you know, and so a problem solving does provide that and then securing a permanent unit, which also is move-in funds. So problem solving is one of the biggest components that we use. Um, when I teach it to others, I like to ex um, link it to somebody who broke a leg and needs a crutch because this is only going to be temporary, right? As soon as like I'm this leg heals, I can go back and walk on my own without a need of any other support. Problem solving is our crutch in this moment when we can plug it in, get the family back to where they need, and then it the component is removed. Safe parking. So sometimes when our shelter or interim housing options are at capacity, if a family does own a vehicle, we can connect them to safe parking, which is a designated area where these families can go and park their cars. There is constant security and they only allow the cars that are gonna be staying in that lot to come in at night. If, I know this isn't ideal for a family, but you know it provides an alternative to rather staying at the target lot, target parking lot, and then uh, hoping that security doesn't call somebody to show up and wake you up at night. Safe parking is that just in a more, um, in, in a lo one lo co-located place. Family interim housing, this is our shelter portion. Um, so we have crisis housing, motel vouchers, and then private shelters. This is, it's just, this slide, excuse me, this slide is just meant to show that interim housing can look different at every spa. We have some spas who only deal with motels opposed to we have other spas who only have shelter-based locations. So uh, we just put on this so that you know that interim housing or shelter looks different at every spa. Uh, and then we do want to highlight here that while some spas, most spas do provide motel vouchers, this isn't something that is just being said, because then we do have a lot of participants show up and say that they only want to go into a motel um, setting for shelter. But we have found and research has found that placing them at, at a house space location where we have staff 24 seven, where there is uh, access to a refrigerator, access to a stove is more ideal for families than being in a motel. We also offer, the CES also offers housing navigation. So once a family is in our interim housing program, they will be connected to a navigator who will help them navigate what is the housing market, not necessarily for purchasing, but for renting, right? The, the targeted goal is always permanent housing. So this navigator will help the participant fill out applications, find, you know, if they're missing a social security card or IDs, but the housing navigator gets the family ready to move into permanent housing. And then we have TLS. Um, if some of you are familiar with our CES system, this is this program was previously called Rapid Rehousing. It has now been rebranded to be called TLS. But TLS is just the rental sub, uh, ongoing subsidy that helps these families maintain their unit. Uh, within TLS, families are also connected to a long, longer term case management. And so um, it is through the TLS program. And then we have PSH, so permanent supportive housing. So this is an ongoing rental subsidy for the unit, wherever um, this family were to move into, right? The unit has the subsidy, not necessarily the participant. And so in the past, PSH for families was very limited and we do know this. So as it continues to evolve, we have more and more PSH coming online for families. Do we have any questions? And I know, I know this was a very condensed 
and a lot of information was given and we are going to share these slides and you might be going over them later and being like what what did she say what what was this so again i do want i know that yenny already highlighted it but again we're having a full training on this october 10th and we hope that most of you can join us